great job. In Israel, in ancient Israel, there were two sins that could not be forgiven by ritual sacrifice. One was murder, because that was a betrayal of life, which was given by God. The second sin that could not be forgiven by ritual sacrifice was incest or adultery, because that was the betrayal of an intimate relationship that was also given by God. And the reason they couldn't be forgiven is because they struck at the heart of God's covenant. These sins were more than simply breaking the law. They were seen as a rejection of God's love and a rejection of God's relationship by the rejecting of the way God set for his people to live and for the purpose of that living. You remember the great King David of Israel? one of the greatest kings that Israel has ever seen. He was called God's beloved. He committed both of those sins. Remember the story? The wars had come to a point that they were manageable and King David was no longer on the front line, so he was kind of hanging around his palace. And one evening, at, in the at late afternoon, hanging out on his roof, which was the equivalent of our back porch, he sees in the distance Bathsheba, who is married to one of his generals by the name of Uriah. She's taking a bath, and he wants her. So he summoned her, and he had her, and lo and behold, not too much later, she turns out pregnant, and her husband is at war. Go figure. So David tries to make sure nobody knows what has happened, and he sends for Uriah to come home, and he tries to entice Uriah to go in to be with his wife, welcome home, enjoy the time. And Uriah was an honorable man. He said, I cannot sleep in a comfortable bed when my men are out fighting the war. So he feeds him strong wine and suggests he goes in to his wife. And Uriah was an honorable man. So David has no other choice in his mind to cover this up but to send Uriah to the front line where he knows he will be killed. When he gets word that Uriah is dead, he sends for Bathsheba and marries him, marries her. So now the day, you know, everything's good. God, of course, knew the truth. So he sent the prophet Nathan to confront King David. And as Nathan confronted him, David's excuses and justifications and denials began to fall away, and his heart was convicted of what he had done. But there was no way to fix these things with God, because according to the law of Moses, there was no sacrifice that would pay the price. You see, now David had a real problem. But Nathan, speaking for God, helped David appeal to God's mercy, to throw himself on the mercy of the court, so to speak. And the result of that throwing of himself at the mercies of God is recorded as Psalm 51, which we're going to read later. In fact, if you want to take it out, take a look at it, it's on this insert. That's Psalm 51. So Psalm 51 becomes for us a wonderful guide of how do we approach God during those times when we feel the furthest away from God. Whether it's something we've done or something that's happened to us. Whatever it is that's separating us from God, Psalm 51 becomes a guide. So as you look at Psalm 51, let's take a look at how David approaches God after he has done the two unforgivable sins by sacrifice. Verses 1 and 2 are at the very beginning. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. David appeals to God's covenant love, a promise that God will always love us forever, no matter what. A promise that we often break to God, but God never breaks for us. David has faith in God's unbelievable loyalty for him. 
Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins, David writes. The Hebrew word for compassion or mercy is hesed, and that word comes from the word for womb, like a mother's womb. Because of your great mother love, because of your great compassion, blot out the sins, the stain of my sins. The intimate, protective, unconditional love that David stands before God knowing that he can have hope because of this kind of love. David then continues his plea by confessing that he has indeed rejected God by taking Bathsheba as his home, by killing Uriah. And in so doing those two things, he breaks four out of the last five of the Ten Commandments. You know what they are? You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. All four. And as King David faces God, standing in his own sin, God becomes radically real to him. And he writes, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Now this is more than a specific remembering of something that he did. It's a recognition that we as human beings are a hot mess. We're, we're just a mess. We cannot escape or fix the delusion that we really can run our own lives without God because we are smarter and slicker and better than God. And we don't consciously think that, but that's what our actions say. So in other words, David realizes that the only hope that he has of staying right with God is to actually depend on God to clean him up to renew the joy of life that comes when he is in right relationship with God. And because David recognizes um, that today it was Bathsheba, tomorrow it may be someone else's kingdom, or cheating on our taxes, or fluffing a story to get our own way, or you guys fill in the blank. Everyone here can fill in a blank. So even though we don't like facing God, because when we face God, then we have to admit the stuff that we are not really proud of, the stuff that makes us feel shameful, the stuff that makes us feel dirty. But even though we don't like facing God, it is the only hope we have to be made whole, to be restored in a relationship with God and with others, because we cannot fix ourselves. We cannot fix ourselves. When I was teaching confirmation, one of my favorite verses comes from Romans 7. You can look it up. And it goes something like this. I do what I do not want to do, and I do not do what I do want to do. Who will save me from myself? Thank God for Jesus Christ. We cannot fix ourselves. David tried, did he not? How'd that work for him? How does it work for any of us? So David does the only thing that he can do to be whole again. He begs for mercy. That's in those first couple of verses. Have mercy on me, O God. He confesses that he has rejected God. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. And then he asks that God deliver him. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. And so David humbles himself before God, and he experiences God's mercy. He experiences God's mother love, and he's filled with a gratitude that overflows into his relationship with others and into his relationship with God. He says down at the very last line on the front of the bulletin, or the insert, then I will teach your ways to rebels other folks who are like me, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood. Is that not relationship with others? Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. I will sing of your forgiveness. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart.
we're not so different from King David, are we? There is not a person in this sanctuary who has, has or ever will live a sinless life. If you're here where you have lived a sinless life and expect to continue to do that, raise your hand. Exactly. Every time we step away from God and every time we step away from God's ways, we are in essence rejecting God and his love. Lent is a time of reflection into our inner selves, a time to reflect on who God is, who we are and who we are not, and what the condition of our relationship with God is like. Lent is not simply a time of somber, chest-beating, confession and pain. It's the very pathway to restore joy and to resurrection life. It is a journey of hope that is launched from a firm foundation of faith, knowing that God will receive us, even me, when we truly throw ourselves on the mercy of the court. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But we can go through the motions tonight, and we can leave this sanctuary with a very pious black cross on our foreheads. Or we can begin our Lenten journey facing God on our knees and receive the hope of the cross, the joy that is found in God's mercy and the promise of new life. The sacrifice you desire, O oh God, is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. O oh, Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Grant us your peace.